Before we begin today's episode of Potterless, I have a very special announcement, and that is that we are taking the show on the road! That is right, Potterless is going to be live in concert? Um, we're going to be the opening act for Join the Party at Join the Party Live. It's in New York City, June 9th. You can go to bit.ly slash join the party live for more information as well as tickets. But we're going to have a fun set opening up the show for them. We're going to have Kelly Beckman and Julia Shafini, who have been on past episodes, discussing some Harry Potter canon material. It's going to be very fun. I'm very excited. And it's just a fun little multitude party. Uh, if you're not sure what multitude is, it is a production collective that Potterless is a part of. There are four podcasts on this collective, the other three being Spirits, Join the Party, and Waystation, all amazing podcasts run by amazing people, most of which have been guests on Potterless. So if you want to see more information about those podcasts and you need something to fill the gap between the two weeks that Potterless episodes release, you can go to multitude.productions and see some of those amazing podcasts. Speaking of awesome stuff, we have new patrons to welcome to the team. So huge shout out to Gary James, Jess Eatwood, Marianne Krupa, Reed Lisa Dingle, Laura Maggi, Aaron Anderson, Seven Bear, Sarah, Trisha D, Annie Bai, Samantha Miramontes, Haley Stufflebean, Chelsea Marin, Alex Surrett, Anna Berg, Sierra Ruzer, and Katia Owu, and an enormous shout out to our newest producer level patrons, Rosemary Dodge, Jill Boulay, Maria Lisa C. Keen, Maria Paulson, Jennifer Inglis, Ariel, Christina Emerson, Romina Riva De Nira, Serenity, and Kumail Doc. They join the ranks of Leanne, Vicky, Aaron, Erica Calvin, Michael, Sadie, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah. Deborah Clow, Alex, Rebecca, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Juan, Sheila, Jenna, Kieran, Louise, Akanksha, Sarah, Rebecca, Abid, Caitlin, Lee, Ayana, Benjamin, and Dave, who never get to the front of the line in a food establishment and go, ooh, ooh, ah, I don't know what to get. They always get to the front of the line and know exactly what they want to order. If you want to be like these awesome people and get access to cool bonus content like bonus episodes, directors, commentary, shirts, stickers, patron-only live streams, you can go to patreon.com slash potterless and pledge today. And finally, I also wanted to tell you guys about a fun podcast called Teen Creeps. I really think you'll enjoy it if you like Potterless. So if you grew up reading those dog-eared paperbacks with the neon cover art and ridiculous insane titles, whether it's Goosebumps or other books of that nature, Teen Creeps is the podcast for you. It's hosted by grown-up comedians, just like me, Kelly Nugent and Lindsay K. Tai, who dive headfirst into the best, but also the worst, of young adult pulp fiction of the 80s and 90s. So people like R.L. Stein, Christopher Pike, Francine Pascal, all of those types of authors. It's basically like a book club that doubles as a sleepover, but they tackle the important questions such as, well, what should I do if my high school boyfriend is an ancient ghost? And how can I avoid getting murdered at my own prom? Also, Kelly and Lindsay have amazing guests from the podcast universe to talk about this YA pulp fiction that they're obsessed with. If you enjoy Potterless, you will enjoy Teen Creeps. It is a very similar nature in that they love the material, but they also are not afraid to poke fun at the material. It's a fun little banter. It's kind of like if the girls from My Favorite Murder started a book club. It's a fun time. So you can find Teen Creeps from the Forever Dog Podcast Network on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes come out every Wednesday, so go on and get creepy. But without further ado, let's get into episode 40 of Potterless, covering chapters 5 and 6 of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, starring Gabrielle Urbina and Sarah Shackett of Wolf 359. <laughs> Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a 26-year-old man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. My name is Mike Schubert. I am that man, and I'm here joined not only by one guest, but two guests. Woo! It's a spicy one. We have two of the writers and creators of an amazing podcast called Wolf 359. I'm here with Sarah Shackett and Gabrielle Urbina. Guys, how's it going? Excellent, now that we're here. Yeah. We were yeah. having a deeply mediocre day that just skyrocketed into the stratosphere. <laughs> As so often happens when you listen to the Potterless podcast. That's right. Oh my goodness. I'm so glad that I paid you guys a lot of money so that you would just say nice things on my podcast. Yeah, checks uh, in the mail, right? Yeah, oh yeah. Excellent. I got it is mine. certainly in the mail. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we're going to get into some meaty chapters from Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, chapters five through nine over the course of these two episodes. So I say we just get right into it because there is a lot to discuss. There is a lot. Oh, yeah. So we'll start off right away. Chapter five, which is called An Excess of Phlegm, which right off the bat, I was like, well, that's gross. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the this imagery is, about. is real. 
Because <laughs> yeah. it's not just phlegm, it's an excess. No, and in sort of the true tradition of Harry Potter chapter titles, either sneakily telling you everything or telling you nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yep. Yeah. Oh, exactly. It's either you'll get a chapter title like this or you'll get the Department of Mysteries. And you're like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen in this one. <laughs> <laughs> There's no in between. So Dumbledore and Harry are greeted at the burrow by Tonks and Mrs. Weasley. Tonks says Watcher Harry, which I had to Google because I was like, what, what does this mean? Apparently it's British for what's up. I don't know if you guys knew that. I did not. Yeah, that's how she's a she's a cool person who's down with the youths. Yes. <laughs> that's how you know it. I, uh, reading this book growing up in Costa Rica, I definitely learned this word from oh, Harry yeah. Potter. There's a number of, of words, I think, that even growing up in the States, um, you're just like, go with and don't quite understand because you're 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. And then you just know British slang now. But yes, yeah. watcher. Hello, fellow youth. How are you doing today? <laughs> she says watch her as she kicks up her skateboard and flips up her yeah, sunglasses. Her son, yeah. Right, and, turns her know, cap around. Her, <laughs> turns her cap backwards, puts on her slap bracelet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right, Man, that's right. Tonks would be feeling so much better if she had a skateboard right now. Mm. Right, because you're right, Tonks is not feeling super great. She is uh, generally sad looking and tries to find an excuse to leave right away once she sees Dumbledore, which is pretty suspect. She won't look him in the eye, and Dumbledore's like, oh, no, don't leave because me. I have to leave to see Scrimge Hour. And it's almost like the awkward, like, walking in the same direction as someone thing, but they're both like, uh, uh, we got to leave. Uh, so something is brewing between them. I love how how much Rowling, like, sort of, like, hammers it in because the description <laughs> is like, she looks ill. Yeah. And where there was color before, there's now sort of, like, muted gray toes. Mousy hair, I think. And then yeah. Harry is like, Tonks, you look awful. She's like, yeah, I'm not feeling great. It's like, well, I wonder what I'm supposed to get out of all of this. There seems to be some, like, slight subtextual building here. Right. <laughs> I think Tonks might be sad. Just so you're aware, <laughs> Tonks might be sad. I also love how Dumbledore just, like, very casually, it is I, Dumbledore, as he approaches, mm -hmm. like... Who does that? Only him. Dumbledore does. Yeah. He, I mean, he can do no wrong in my eyes, but in his right. eyes, he's You'd more critical Right. You'd think someone would so. cheer up, and if they could change their appearance, their hair would turn pink upon hearing that, but Tonks does not. Right. Know. No, she does not. So uh, they go inside. Molly makes some food uh, for Harry and says that everyone, including Hermione, is there, but they're all sleeping because it's one in the morning. And then Molly and Harry talk a little bit about Slughorn because she knew that that's the mission that he was on with Dumbledore. And Molly and Arthur basically feel the same way as Harry, where they're just very meh about Slughorn and kind of off put by his weird I collect humans stance <laughs> on life. <laughs> but like, I collect humans, but I don't have time for these Weasley people. Right. Yeah, they're, right. They're not going to advance. <laughs> only the rare stamps, the misprints. Those That's are the, the ones. the only thing I care about. Yeah. Yes. Speaking of misprints, I learned that there's apparently some edition of Harry Potter, like the first edition of the first book has a typo. And that those books with the typo are worth like twenty thousand dollars. The typo is that it lists it's like the the part of the book where it lists Harry's school supply list. It says one wand twice, like it's oh. the second thing and the sixth thing. Apparently, if you have one of those, you can sell it in an auction for like twenty thousand pounds. Have you heard about the error in the fourth book? Have you run into that one? No, I have not. What is that? So quick tangent, but. At the end of the fourth book, when they have um, Priori and Cantatum between yeah. the two wands, and they're summoning sort of all the ghosts of yes. Voldemort, the Kills. last people that Voldemort yeah. killed with the wand, J.K. Rowling wrote it, and it was in the order that she originally wrote it in, it was first Lily appeared, and then James appeared. When actually... No, no, no. That oh, was yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then her editor uh. kind of went, I think it's more dramatic if it's sort of like James appears first and then Lily appears second. Right. And she kind of went, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Uh. And it was only after the book was published that all of a sudden they both kind of looked at each other and went, no, no, no. The oh order my God, matters. Wait a second. No, the order is for yeah. a very, very, very specific <laughs> yeah. reason. And from the second printing on, wow. it's fixed. But if you have sort of like a really, really old school copy of Goblet of Fire, you can still yeah. sort of see it with like the completely plot hole based Whoa. version. Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting. Interesting. We'll get into it a little bit later, but there is a typo in my book. Uh, it's very minor, but there's an errant apostrophe. Hey. And I was like, oh. that's, that's worth <laughs> at least like 500 pounds, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, judging if like the if the whole word, you know, one wand is worth 20,000 pounds, one apostrophe has got to be worth, you know, like, yeah, yeah. at least a couple hundred. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but, sure. But anyway, Molly goes on about Slughorn saying that the ministry is full of people that were his favorites in school, that he helped get positions, and Arthur just was not one of them. And then Molly says, that just shows you that even Slughorn makes mistakes, which is, ah, uh, so cute. Love Molly Weasley. But I love that, like, it's because he just got promoted, <laughs> so it's like, even Slughorn makes mistakes, because my husband is a huge boss. What up? <laughs> that, like, work I've been putting in is finally paid off. He done good. All that hard muggle artifact work. So yeah, Arthur has been promoted to, quote, head of the Office for the Detection and Confiscation of Counterfeit Defensive Spells and Protective Objects, which at first I thought was just like a bullshit position, but you find out he's in charge of 10 people, so kind of a really big promotion. Legit, yeah. pretty legit. I love that counterfeits are a thing. Yes, yeah. it, it makes sense. The more I learn about the wizard economy, just the more fascinated I am. Totally, totally, totally. We do learn more about the wizard economy in this section when we learn about the nut. That's the right. The unit of money that we have not had for the first five books. Arthur has this position because as the fear of Voldemort has risen, so have people making fake Fake potions and various items that are supposed to keep people safe, but it's just people trying to make a quick buck. Mr. Weasley now investigates these to see if they're BS or not. Um, Molly says that most of these things are made by people like Mundungus Fletcher who just don't make their money honestly. But some of the things are actually bad, such as cursed sneakoscopes that were made by a group of Death Eaters so that you couldn't tell when they were creeping Mandunkas up. Mandunkas' life just seems more and more charmed yeah. every time that we hear about it. Just mm -hmm. sort of like each detail just makes it seem like a richer and richer existence. A yeah. stack of terrible choices without <laughs> meaningful consequences. <laughs> He's the guy. <laughs> I, for one, want the Mundungus Fletcher spinoff book just to see the shenanigans that he gets into. Yeah, I want that AMC series. It would be an AMC series. <laughs> He's like the Ant-Man to Marvel where it's like, all right, we need a funny, silly guy that's like still important, but, you know, d contributes nothing serious. I also love that there's just like one sketchy dude who's still like technically a good person or just <laughs> yeah. on the side of the people we care about. Mostly but you these, feel by inertia. Mm -hmm. Like you yeah. kind of feel that he would be working for the bad guys, but at some point someone <laughs> was like, so you need to go look for the black mark. And he was like, ah, Jesus, never mind. I'll just right. like stick with the good guys then. <laughs> yeah, he didn't want to put in like he didn't want to do the work that Death Eaters no. went to. It was too Death much. Death Eaters are super effort. intense. They're yeah, they're a bit much. So Arthur finally returns home and he makes Molly begrudgingly do this code question <laughs> thing where um she has to ask him, what is your dearest ambition? And Arthur responds to find out how airplanes stay up, which is really cute, but a little problematic that there's just no one that's good at math or physics yeah. in the wizarding world. Like no one is an engineer at all. One of my favorite things to think about is sort of the like joyous day when Arthur Weasley is introduced to Wikipedia, <laughs> when finally someone is like, right. sit down and like go to this place. And all of a sudden, just like the floodgates will open. Right. Like I, I forget which which year technically this uh the sixth book takes place in. Ninety six. Ninety six. So the internet okay. right now we're we've still got sort of Yahoo search, mm -hmm. but Wikipedia is coming. Oh yeah. It's it's on the horizon. Yeah. Right? And Arthur is gonna lose his mind and never sleep for like a week consecutively while right. he just looks up and clicks the blue links for everything. You know that he's gonna go like down one of those Wikipedia holes oh, and yeah. just like not emerge oh, for yeah. a month. He's going down a hyperlink hole real quick. Oh yeah. <laughs> so that's that question. And then he then makes her answer his security question for Molly, which is, what do you like me to call you when we're alone together? And she says, Molly Wobbles. As, and the, the book says, quote, whispered a mortified Mrs. Weasley. <laughs> She's the best. She's They're just the, the most best. adorable. Yeah. They're great. They're so good. I already like them a lot, but they rose so high in my favorite character list in this chapter alone. This is where my typo comes in. So Mr. Weasley starts re uh, recapping his day, and at one point he says, some idiots started selling metamorph metals, but idiots has an apostrophe in it for some reason. 
We're looking I, at I think uh, it's PDF, I think yeah. it's some idiot has started selling metamorph some metals. Idiots oh, started. oh, yeah. some idiot has started, not some idiots plural. Yeah. yeah. Oh, boo. Singular. Boo. <laughs> I mean, I could be wrong. No, that's prob that's got to be what it is. He could be a front for a cabal of idiots. We do not know this the is whole true. story here. <laughs> In fact, but... I kind of like that interpretation better. <laughs> no, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're probably right. Darn. Either we have a corrected version or No, no. I think you're interpretation is correct that it's some idiot has started but then condensed Alas. darn um, oh man i thought i struck gold none of those pounds are going to me so wow. <laughs> harry heads to bed uh in fred and george's room molly actually has grown to approve of their business because apparently they are killing it at their joke shop making bank they are seriously making bank when Harry puts his head down on the pillow to go to sleep, he feels something hard in there. And this is something that I've brought up in previous episodes. J.K. Rowling really likes to use the phrase uh, groping when she's talking about like feeling for trying to grab something. Right. Just sort of clumsily trying to grab. Yeah. And it's just like, there's got to be another word you can pick. And she's used it twice in the fifth book. And now it comes back again where it's his quote, he gropes inside the pillowcase. And it's like, J.K., can we not? You gotta have a thesaurus on hand. He reached inside the pillowcase. <laughs> right. right, boom, wow. Just there. He <laughs> fumbled accessible. through the pillowcase. Right. Like, that, that gets across the clumsy sense of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but like, no, I'm gonna say gropes. This is very much on par when she says uh, ejaculated instead of yells multiple times throughout the series. It's just right. not, not ideal. So he looks inside, it's a puking pastille, he chuckles, and then goes to sleep. And that's but how you know it's the Weasley twins room. That's the mark of authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just like, they still leave things to mess with people. It's such a concentrate. They don't have, I mean, the borough is a very cramped place, so lots of people double up, but like the mayhem in Fred and George's room, because it's the two of them. It's real. It's a real thing. Oh, yeah. Condensed. So Harry is woken in the morning by Ron and Hermione, who say that Molly is bringing up breakfast because he looks underfed which is apparently the British word for insufficiently fed. So I've had to Google twice in one chapter <laughs> with, <laughs> with these silly words. Harry starts telling them about the slughorn interaction. Hermione reacts weirdly, but then she lies about it. So something is up there that we're going to learn about in five chapters. Um, but for now, it is just swept under the rug. Right. Ginny comes in complaining about someone who hasn't been named. And at first, Harry thinks it's talking about Molly. But then Ron says something to the effect of, oh, come on, don't be so hard on her. And Harry's like, this is not something Ron would say about his mom. And then Hermione, Hermione's also yeah, like, but she's the, the worst. Yep. Yeah. She's just the most <laughs> awful. And Harry's, oh, now I know something's definitely up. Right. Yup, and that's something that is up is Fleur de la Cur, which yeah. I totally forgot that she was dating Bill Ponytail Dragon Skin Fang Earring Weasley. Oh man, the most D and D character ever to live. <laughs> but also like the person that like all the like cool people in the world look up to Bill Weasley and are like, one day we'll be as cool as you. But today is not that day. Yeah, he is described in the book as being very cool. I've had heated discussions about this where. I personally think Bill Weasley is fucking lame as hell. Uh, but I have been since corrected that, like, if you think about this book as being in the mid-90s. Oh, it's spot his on. His style, yeah. like, he's the coolest kid ever. And it's like, oh, okay, actually. And if, for a long time, before they, like, reveal that he's a curse breaker, all I knew is that he worked at a bank. And I was like, why is he cool? He works at the bank. And then, finally, in the fourth book, you learn that he's, like, Indiana goddamn Jones yeah. for the yeah. bank. <laughs> like, right, completely like the different. Way, the same way that, like, technically, speaking indiana jones works for a university right yeah weasley right he works for a bank <laughs> okay. yeah. very true very i'm true. a charlie weasley man myself I think me that's... too he doesn't get yeah. enough love i don't understand how charlie weasley objectively is like the coolest person they've ever written about and we just never hear about him like he goes to romania to like wrangle dragons and we've heard maybe eight sentences about him like he's the coolest person yep i don't get he's it too cool for this book that's right. <laughs> yeah that that might be it he's just, like oh, i can't be in this not be encapsulated no, no, no. by mere English. I'm, I'm ready for the Charlie Weasley, Mundungus Fletcher spinoff series. <gasps> oh my lord. <laughs> buddy, buddy cop movie right. with Mundungus Fletcher and Charlie Weasley. But one of them has light fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I love 
love it. I love it. I love it. So you learn that not only is she dating Bill still, but they are getting married and no one is happy about it. Everybody hates Fleur so much. Well, Ron seems to be like, come on, give her a chance. Right. Sure. But that's also probably fueled because Ron thinks she's super hot. So yeah. That could be. Yes. And I think a lot of it is fueled by the fact that she is, in fact, super hot. Mm hmm. On mm -hmm. Ron's part and the girl's part. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. But she is also like a bit conceited because later oh, yeah. in, in this section, you, they say that she's admiring her reflection in a spoon. So she is not necessarily the greatest human. No, she's not. I will say this for Fleur Delacour. She wants everyone to be happy. Sure. Which is an admirable quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's sort of like Andy from Parks and Rec. Okay. She, she wants the best for people. She's just not that great at interfacing with people yeah i think she's probably just like one of those people that is like well this is very easy for me Ooh. so i just don't understand why yes. like people have like a difficulty my experience is the same as your experience right yeah yeah yes. oh totally 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 she is apparently there because she only works part-time at gringotts to quote learn her english with two e's uh <laughs> and she's there to to meet the fam it's funny reading her words because they do the apostrophe thing where they leave off certain letters right uh and I lived in Paris for six months, so I've heard oh, cool. a wealth of... Yeah, I was very fortunate to be sent there for a temporary thing for work. So I heard a wealth of French accents. And by reading this one where, like, J.K. Rowling is putting apostrophes in for all the letters, it makes me think she just has the most like obnoxious dramatic French accent where she's like oh Harry I am so happy to see you like yeah. the, like the no one talks like this accent uh <laughs> and I just can't like I know she probably has like a lighter sweeter like you know more pleasant sounding voice but when I read it it's just like the most pretend facsimile caricature of a French accent and I just laugh every time she has a sentence in the book the transcription <laughs> I think to me like very much suggests kind of like MGM in the 30s right. idea of mm, what a French woman yeah, yeah, sounds yeah. like. Yeah. No, never <laughs> underestimate the amount of shade that the British will throw at the French. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, now, I was wondering, I was wondering, I was like, why did J.K. Rowling decide to just shit on Fleur de la Cour for this entire chapter? And now I guess that makes a little more sense because they didn't make fun of her that much in the Goblet of Fire. In the Goblet of Fire, they're like, yeah, she's pretty. She's the best one at Bow Batten. Sure. Right. And now yeah. in this book, they're like, just kidding. Fleur sucks a lot. And here's a bunch of examples about how everyone hates her. And it is funny. Yeah. No, it's hilarious. It's yeah. absolutely hilarious. It seems like she doesn't have that much ambition because all she really cares about is marrying Bill and nothing else. Yeah. Which which makes me question why she was picked for the Goblet of Fire. I thought she was supposed to be like a badass, but she just seems like very fine with being a wife and nothing more. I don't know. I was just shocked that she didn't like seem to have any higher passions. There might be some spin that her coming in fourth in that tournament sort of, you know, shook her Ooh. inner confidence right. or something. But it's not particularly explored at yeah. any point. Yeah. Don't really dive into the inner life of Fleur de la Cour in any meaningful way. Yeah, I mean, she got wrecked in the maze. She did. She did she not did. make it far. <laughs> and she also, in, in the lake, I think, yeah. like, really Oh, in the yeah, lake. she was really bad in the lake, yeah. too. Yeah, ooh, yeah. She did bad in the last two yeah. things. She was... Not a fun time. Yeah, that sucks. And she, like, couldn't save her own sister. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, just yeah. going through that and thinking that your sister was dead and it was your fault. Yeah. Wow. Okay. This is good. I like it. I like it. But let's get back to shitting on her. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Weasley isn't the biggest That's... fan of how quickly everything has happened. Because no. <laughs> uh, apparently they've only known each other for a year. But she understands why. And she says that with Voldemort back, people are rushing into things since yeah. they yeah. might be dead tomorrow. So why delay anything? And then she's like, oh, this same sort of thing happened last time. And then Ginny butts in and is like, yeah, including you and dad, Ginny said slyly. Ginny's which, oh, best. my God. And Mrs. Weasley's like, that was different. We were, like, made for each other in, like, a yep. Romeo and Juliet sense. Not like these two morons. Right. <laughs> exactly. She's like, we were made for each other. Bill and Fleur, uh, I just, uh. she's like, Bill is so, you know, Bill is more calm and reserved and Fleur is. And then Ginny butts in and says, is a cow. <laughs> which, oh. Oh, Ginny destroys in these next couple chapters. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. The snark is strong. Oh, it's so strong. I joked how in the fifth book it should be renamed to Harry Potter and the Rise of Ginny Weasley. I think the <laughs> sixth book needs to be renamed to like Harry Potter and the Utter Dominance of Ginny Weasley because she murders in these next four chapters. Just it is her time. Yeah. Yes. time shine. Oh my gosh. Hermione joins in on making fun of Fleur by calling Fleur pathetic. 
and then Ginny says that Molly keeps having tonks around in hopes that Bill will fall in love with her instead, which is a way better couple. Like, I feel like that makes way more sense. Yeah, well, we'll see what it, we'll see what happens. I yeah. hope it does. I would like that so much more. But no spoilers. No, no, no. We would we never. Would, we would never. never. Dare. <laughs> thank God. Thank God. Because of bringing up tonks, they get onto the whole tonks being sad thing. And basically, they reveal that she's not taking the death of Sirius very well. They remind Harry that Sirius was her cousin. Ron brings up a good point, though, saying that they barely knew each other since Sirius was in Azkaban the whole time. But Hermione says that Tonks is super upset about it because she kind of blames herself for his death. Right. She feels responsible. Exactly. Yeah. She was fighting Bellatrix one-on-one -on -one before Bellatrix moved on to fight Sirius. So if she could have taken care of Bellatrix, then she wouldn't have killed Sirius. But it's just a survivor's guilt type thing. Like, it's definitely not her fault, but she's just blaming herself for this situation. Survivor's guilt being something that none of our main trio no, is are dealing feeling with. at all. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Harry's doing surprisingly well. Yeah. Given the fifth book. Mm -hmm. Harry's oh, doing yeah. surprisingly well. Yeah, he got all his anger out on Dumbledore's knickknacks on his desk, and now he is more calm. Yeah. Apparently, also, Tonks has been having problems with metamorphosing, which is why her hair and stuff all looked rough. So, not the best time for Tonks. I'm hoping she turns around because she was so great, and it sucks to see her so sad. Molly then calls for Ginny to come downstairs, and Ginny yells, I'm talking with this lot, which I think it's great that she refers to her group of friends and family as a lot. And then she also butts in saying, like, Ugh, I bet mom just wants me to go downstairs so she's not stuck alone in the kitchen with Fleur. <laughs> the, uh, the insult train just keeps on rolling. My favorite thing, I think, out of sort of, like, all of their interactions with Fleur in this chapter is there's sort of this moment where, like, Harry turns to Ron and is like, you've been spending a lot of time with her. Don't you get, like, used to mm -hmm. her? Like, isn't there sort of a point of, <laughs> yeah, like, like, diminishing returns? Right, the immunity kicks in. And, and like... Ron is like, <laughs> And if she surprises you, like, if she catches you off guard, there is no force yep. on heaven and earth yeah, that can save you. Ron. Like, you're just gonna, like, you know, <laughs> you're gonna go down. Yeah. I love sort of, like, just that moment where they, like, just discuss her, like, she's right. this force of nature. But she's just kind of, like, vertigo. <laughs> Yeah, basically. And she's living in their house. She's like the person you don't want to run into awkwardly in the hallway, but she's in your home. So <laughs> she's inescapable. Yeah. And I just like to imagine sort of like Ron before they go into like dinner or anything, just like standing outside like the dining room, just like. Right. And Hermione's like, breath. what are you doing? He's like, <laughs> stealing myself. <laughs> Uh, so it's just Harry, Ron, and Hermione left. And at that point, Harry tells them about Dumbledore giving him private lessons. And eventually he gets on to the prophecy. Mm -hmm. And Ron and Hermione have an amazing attitude towards it. They are very optimistic. Uh, they think it's great that Dumbledore is giving him lessons. They're trying to be like proactive about the prophecy. They don't get mad at him for not telling them right away or whatever. Hermione then gets punched in the face by a telescope that the twins had in their room. She just grabs it and then it like puffs some black smoke and punches her in the face her and George gives her a black eye. Danger zone, man. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Like I wouldn't want to stay in friend George's room. I felt I would feel like everything is jinx. Right. I wouldn't touch yeah. anything at all. Just like you have to like <laughs> tiptoe in and out right, right, of right. like mm -hmm. the one side of the bed that you are sure is booby trap. <laughs> Only Harry Potter who has escaped death. Mm -hmm. can stay there comfortably. Pretty much, pretty much. Harry's heart is just warmed by the fact that they've received this news so well. But then the topic shifts to owls. Harry brings up that Dumbledore said they should arrive today, and Hermione starts freaking out. <laughs> absolutely freaking out. She like runs downstairs, asks Molly if any owls came. They see owls coming in the window. She starts freaking out even more and more. She's like pacing, sweating, going over her exam answers. It's hilarious. It's every like nerd that I was friends with that freaked out about tests. It's and of so course, good. The while they're endearing waiting for thing. the results, Fleur is kind of going like, in my school, we had this way better <laughs> system where we did it this and not then, with this and not that. And everyone is just like, Shut Thank up, you. not helping. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the contribution yeah. that did exactly nothing. <laughs> so the owls come in. Harry's grades are mostly fine. They're pretty much all E's, but he got an outstanding in Defense Against the Dark Arts. He got an A in Astronomy. He got a P in Divination and a D in History of Magic, which my concern was, wait, he passed out during that exam 
that's not fair. Can he get a retest? But just nope. Nah. I remember when I first read it, I was like, wait a minute. He like just like straight up didn't do half the exam. Mm-hmm. And Harry wasn't a whiz at history in the first place. So he was probably getting some of the stuff wrong before then. Yeah. What do you have to do to get a troll? Yeah. <laughs> because he didn't get like bottom marks. True. Like, you know? True. I guess you just have to completely Maybe it's fail. Like Answer a, nothing. Yeah, like a bell curve grade distribution kind of deal where like the sure. worst person in the class gets troll. Oh, uh, yeah. That makes more mm-hmm. sense. Or something. Maybe, maybe. Maybe. Harry's pretty know. satisfied with his grades until he realizes that his E in potions is not enough because when he talked to McGonagall last year about it to be an Auror, she said that you got to have a Newt in potions and Snape only accepts O's in potions. We'll learn about this later. Yeah. But my first note at this, I wrote it down in my notes. I was like, there's no way that Harry's not going to get to be an Auror. There's going to be some technicality that lets him skate by with this E. And we learn about that later. Good instinct. Yeah. <laughs> it just They <laughs> talked about it too much. Like There was like five sentences about Harry being sad about like, oh, I guess I'll never be an Auror. That I was like, okay, there's no way. Like This is trying to prime you to feel feel bad for him so that when there is the inevitable plot twist you'll feel happy and excited you kind of hear the sad <laughs> violin music you do play. And, and it's like a very half-hearted like it's not even i think a full page of him being sad about the possibility mm-hmm. going away or him freaking out about the possibility he going just kind of like turns to the window and like exhales Sighs. and is like oh well oh well there goes that dream yeah, yeah. he looks at his grades and he, him and ron are happy but then he turns to the window and it's like all around me are familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Until someone touches him on the shoulder. Right. <laughs> right. Oh. So Ron's grades are fine. He qualified for seven owls, which is more than Fred and George combined. So that's pretty sweet. And then, of course, Hermione got 10 O's and one E in Defense Against the Dark Arts. So she actually looks sad. Harry's like, you're upset, aren't you? And she's like, no. But she definitely but she is. is sad that she didn't get straight O's. The question that this raises in my mind is what the heck were Fred and George doing during their last two years at Hogwarts? Better things. Yeah, just making their wheezes all day, every day. They just, like, lived senioritis yeah. so hard. Because yeah. that's the weird thing is that we learn about the class schedule is that you're somewhat, <laughs> like, if they have less than seven classes between them, like, they're taking, what, three each? Like, they just have tons of free periods. You're almost incentivized to not do well on your owls so that your sixth and seventh year, you just don't have class. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which to be fair, makes a lot of Goblet of Fire in Order of the Phoenix make more sense. Right. That they just were not occupied. Yeah. They have yeah. so much free time because they just didn't take any classes. Yeah. So that's the end of chapter five. And then we get into chapter six, Draco's Detour, which I was enticed by the fact that the name of the chapter was after Draco. So, uh, and this chapter lived up to it. We learn that Harry spends most of his days at the borough playing two-on-two Quidditch. And if you've ever listened to the Potterless podcast before, you know that I despise the sport. And you know what doesn't make any goddamn sense? Two-on-two Quidditch. Are you kidding me? That means there are more balls than people combined. Yeah, Yeah. I imagine it's just... It, at that or point, the same becomes... amount. There's a snitch, there's two beaters, yeah. and a quaffle. So there's four balls and four total people playing. I don't know how you play two on two. They mentioned playing three on three. I imagine you lose the you lose the beaters. I guess. It's just, it's just snitch like and you're, quaffle. You're playing, and keepers. Yeah, you're just playing soccer, basically. And there's a snitch involved, maybe. Yeah. yeah. But are... Are the bludgers still active, though? That's a question. Do you just set the balls loose? Oh, right. yeah. you, have, you can't play with the beaters. It would be too much. They would just be, like, constantly beating up the kids if you played with the beaters. So it's got to be, like, quaffle yeah. only with the snitch. And yeah. this is what we decided, whatever, I think it was in, like, the second book, they said they played, like, three on three or something. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. at this point, I was like, how do you play three on three? Now it's whittled to two on two. Next book, Harry's going to be playing Ron one on one in Quidditch. And who knows what the hell even that means. But uh, we learn that Hermione plays with them, which is surprising that she plays. But then we learn that she's garbage sauce, which is not surprising. And I so want the book to dwell on this for yeah. longer than it does. I want the nope. like one sentence. I, I <laughs> want to sort of see how the heck they got her to play to yeah, agree yeah, yeah, to yeah, do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Was it play with them or sit in the kitchen with Fleur? Oh, it had to be. That, had that's the to only be. reason that she would get yep. on the broom. That yeah, Come that on. I think we've nailed it. This writes itself. <laughs> So it's Harry's birthday, but no time for festivities. Lupin comes in and just Debbie Downers the ever living crap out of Harry's yeah. birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Says that Karkarov is found dead in a shack with the dark mark all over his body, but he's 
surprised that Kirkoro survived a whole year. Is it over his body or just over the location? Oh, I thought it was like on his body. I, I don't, don't know remember. If I misread it. They found Igor Kirkoro's body in a shack up north. Yeah. The dark mark had been set over it. It could be either it one, could be really. Either one. Ambiguous. Yeah. Mm. Given the history, I think they mean over the house because that's what they did in other stuff. In my brain, <laughs> when I read this, I thought they meant it was set over his body. So they just put like either a bunch of small or just one big dark art mark over his dead corpse. But regardless, he has been murked. We also learned that Regulus, who is Sirius's brother, apparently only made it a few days after defecting from the Death Eaters. We then learned that Florian Fortescue, who owns the ice cream shop, and Ollivander, the creepy wand guy from <laughs> Diagon Alley, are both presumed dead because their shops were just unexpectedly empty quickly with no signs of struggle. So the thought is that they were also killed. And then Harry has this funny sentence where he goes, oh, not Fortescue. He used to give me free ice creams. And I guess it's a British thing to say, like, to call it ice creams, plural. But yeah. to me, it just sounded like because I grew up in America, like it makes me imagine like a three year old kid just being like, oh, no, he gave me free ice creams. And uh, I found that funny, <laughs> which I feel bad about because he's dead. It's also like. The ice cream maker is gone. Oh, no. Also the wand maker. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but the ice cream maker. Not the ice cream guy. Priorities. <laughs> you know, Priorities. What do we do? He hasn't existed in any of these books until this sentence. The first time we learn about him is that he's dead. So um, Harry learns also that he has been made Quidditch captain. And apparently this makes you equal status with a prefect, which is dumb. <laughs> He gets a badge and he gets to use the prefect bathrooms just because he's good at a sport. I think you he's just, in need, a leadership to, you just position, need to accept man. that this world values the sport yeah. a heck of a lot more than you ever will. Yeah, I'm fighting a losing battle. But I guess in a world where there is only one sport, there's this no is true. other there's sport. No escape. I guess if you're yeah. really good at the one sport, I guess they put you on a high That's pedestal. Awesome. But ugh. I thought it was quite stupid that he gets prefect perks because he's, I don't know, the best person on the team. So Ron thinks it's pretty cool that he's the captain and says, oh, Harry, you're my captain. That's cool. Well, if you let me back on the team, that is dot, 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 ha, ha, dot, 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 <laughs> keynote space yeah. between the ha. So like definitely like awkward laugh. But then Harry doesn't say anything. And then they just change the conversation to planning their trip to Diagon Alley, which is like, what? How? How can you just leave Ron on the most awkward hanging cliffhanger ever? He's insecure about his quidge abilities. And Harry just is like, so when are we getting our textbooks, Molly? Like, oh. Uh. Because <laughs> he is a super smooth and mature 16-year-old. Uh. He just does not know how to do the whole, like, we're going to have, like, auditions and everyone is going to get a chance to, like, you know, mm -hmm. you can earn your yeah. spot back on the and team. And I'm pulling for you, buddy. Yeah. yeah. He just does, he does not have the social equipment to do that. <laughs> no. He does not have a career in politics. No. That is for sure. <laughs> Can't dodge an awkward question. He just doesn't say anything. So they're getting ready to leave for their trip to Diagon Alley, and Bill hands Harry a sack of money that is from Harry's vault, because apparently getting gold in public takes like five hours now because everyone's been trying to get their gold out and there's increased security and all this other stuff. Gringotts took a turn towards the Bank of America side of things. Yeah, but uh, here's a question. Isn't this definitely a crime and or felony? Like, he took Harry's money out of a vaulted bank without his permission. That's my question, is how... Because supposedly there are, boy. like... But he's, but like, the curse things. breaker. We know there are things down in the Gringotts vault that are going to eat you if you take stuff that's not yours. Like, they say that in the first book. How is he able... There's, like, that thing in the door that, like, only authorized people can go through, like, right. the door or whatever. It'll, like, burn you alive if you go through it. And Bill's just like, well, I stole money from you knowing you were going to need it. Maybe you can have authorized users. Like on credit cards or whatever. I guess because he works at the I bank. I think you guys are just underestimating how cool Bill Weasley is. <laughs> <Clearly>. <laughs> yeah, he, he went up to the booby traps and the booby traps was like, oh man, we can't kill this guy. He's, He's too, too cool. cool. Or we're just not seeing the like Indiana Jones style, like, you know, Escape long set guts. piece. Yeah. <laughs> That, like, or uh, oh that yeah he has to do all this he has to do all the Indiana Jones stuff to get around the booby traps but then he gets back and he's like wasn't even a thing and BB let him know if you need more yeah, yeah this was quicker than you waiting in uh, line for five hours <laughs> that would be a great little spinoff oh mm -hmm. my goodness 
Fleur calls Bill so helpful and starts to stroke his nose. And then Ginny is sitting behind them and Mimes vomiting into her cereal bowl, which makes Harry laugh so hard he chokes on his cereal, which uh, Ginny is just so good. She is so perfect. Book Ginny is so perfect. Why is movie Ginny so bad? Uh, I think some of it's on Steve Close, the screenwriter. I can see it. Um, it's a tough role it's, to it's live tough. up to. It is a tough role, especially, especially when, you're when cast you get cast as like a nine-year-old. A nine-year-old. Sure. Yeah. I don't blame the actress at all. I blame either the director or the screenwriter or whoever is in charge of stepping in and being like, yo, Ginny's supposed to be really sassy and funny. Hype it up. Uh, I haven't seen the sixth movie yet, but like mm-hmm. so far in her appearances in the fourth and fifth, she's just been like there. And I've heard from people that in the six, she's nothing special either. They kind of try to compensate by they like do. giving her these moments of like, look at her. She's super powerful. She's so good at the magics. And it's like, no, least interesting part of it. Yep. Bring it in with the yeah. humor and the sass. Yeah. And, and the, the interaction. Like, but yeah. the movies have to be so focused on the three, the the main trio. It's mm-hmm. tough. You This is the thing that you can do in prose that you absolutely cannot do in film is have the moment where she mimes barking Vomiting, into her yeah. cereal. Yeah. It's like when you've only got two hours or two and a half hours to like condense a 600 page. Sure. It's, it's, it's real tough. You have to book. Yeah. And I've like I've given the movies grief because one of the things that made me really sad in the movie versus the book for the fourth one is that like Victor Crumb is actually like a really interesting character that he's the most famous Quidditch player ever. And he's the biggest hotshot at school, but he's like really yeah. shy and quiet and scrawny and kind of like a nerd that just happens to be really good at Quidditch. And I thought that, you know, in the movies, he's just like a meathead and that made me really sad, but like he's a side character. It makes sense. You got to cut stuff out for time. Oh yeah. But, oh yeah. Like, Ginny's really important. And even if you can't get these funny moments where she's, you know, jokes along with Harry and is really silly, you could at least get a thing that I think was really crucial in the fifth is that she's the only one that stands up to Harry when he's being a really angsty jerk and like yelling at people and stuff, especially in the ministry when he's being really sassy and giving barking out orders and like not listening to anyone's suggestions. Ginny consistently stands up to him, which I think is really important for like why their relationship makes sense is that Ginny's one of the few people that actually like doesn't put up with his BS. Yeah. And that's something that I really liked in the fifth book. And I thought it was cool. I was like, wow, look at Ginny. She's even a year younger than Harry and she's not taking his crap. And then the movie was just like, oh yeah, she's just there. Which was, ugh, yeah. it just made me sad. It is underwhelming. Very much so. And yeah. it is, it's one of those things where like they clearly decided that defining her as someone who challenged uh, the main character didn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And I, it, it, you're right. You need the, the fact that one of the defining things about Ginny Weasley is she doesn't take any of your crap Mm -hmm. to have her relationship with all of them make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I think that's why some people think like, oh, Harry and Hermione should have been together. That would have made more sense. Like those are the people that only watch the movies or didn't read the books thoroughly enough to see. And then also how the hell did JK Rowling at one point, like people have, and I've kind of been on that camp where like JK Rowling has not been the greatest uh, recently with some of the stuff she has said and done. And uh, everyone should have jumped off the ship when J.K. Rowling was like, oh, yeah, I should have made Harry and Hermione get together. Like, no, they don't make any <laughs> sense at all. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, you wrote these characters, and Harry and Ginny are perfect for each other. And you're going to go back and be like, oh, I probably should have made it Hermione. You're like, no, that is, what are you doing? Come on, you're J.K. Yeah, Rowling. She and George Lucas just need to have some tea. Yeah. And, like, really yeah. talk about, because I think it does something to you, the legacy of creating something so big. Mm-hmm. That, like, the, the impulse to revise is there. It's real. And I want to have the faith that kind of like what she means is I should have realized that back in book one and kind of right. structured it and streamlined in that way, not kind of something like, oh, in book, you know, seven, I should have had them come together. But yeah, it's there's an element of just like have whatever doubts you need to have, have like whatever conversations you need to have, have them in private though. Yeah. Yes. yeah. You don't need to be inflicting that upon all of us. We don't need that kind of whiplash in our reading. <laughs> it tampers with the relationship you have with the book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway. But let's get back to Bill Weasley being cool though. Let's always get back to Bill Weasley yeah. being cool. <laughs> it's so cool that the alarms don't go off. <laughs> They take the special security cars to Diagon Alley, and they're greeted by Hagrid, which is a surprise. Pretty sweet. The very first words are out of his mouth are saying, oh, Harry, you should see Buckbeak uh, or uh, Wither Wings. Oh. Like, <laughs> Master of subtlety, Hagrid. Yeah. This just shows how busy the ministry must be. If it was peacetime, oh, yeah. Hagrid would have given this <laughs> <Yeah>. away. <laughs> 
<laughs> months ago. So good, so good. So they go to the leaky cauldron, which is empty for the first time, except for Tom, who they describe as toothless again, which goes back to my earliest, one of the things I loved in the first book is that they describe Tom as, quote, looking like a toothless walnut, which is my favorite description of a human ever. <laughs> Isn't that great? It's great. Yeah, so they head into Diagon Alley, and then they decide to split up. Mr. and Mrs. Weasley are going to go get books, and the squad and Hagrid are going to go get new robes, because Harry and Ron both have had growth spurts, and the robes don't fit them anymore. So when they go into this store, which is called Madame Malkin's, they go inside and they see Draco Malfoy. Ooh, boy. Mm -hmm. So he is in there being super sassy to his mom. And then finally he sees them. And of course, what does he do upon sight of them? Calls Hermione a mudblood in his first sentence. He's coming out strong. Yeah. He's like, yeah. ain't nobody got time to waste in this book. We need to get our defining character traits out front yeah. and center. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be my first sentence in this book. Have a racial slur in it. So Ron and Harry do not take kindly to this, and they point their wands at him. And then Madame Malkin, who is the store owner, says, okay, I'm not going to stand for this language or these wands. Like, everybody calm down. Then Narcissa comes in, and she, she starts talking smack to Harry, but Harry does not back down. And it was so good that I, like, I just wrote in my notes, like, read page 113 on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> because... It is so good, and I honestly just would have written the entire thing. Narcissus says, put those away, she coldly said to Harry and Ron. If you attack my son again, I shall ensure that it is the last thing you ever do. Really, said Harry, taking a step forward and gazing smoothly into the smoothly arrogant face that for all its pallor, pallor? pallor. I don't know what this word means, pallor, still resembled her sisters. He was as tall as she was now. Going to get a few Death Eater pals to do us in, are you? Madame Malkin squealed and clutched at her heart. Really, you shouldn't accuse. Dangerous things to say. Wands away, please. But Harry did not lower his wand. Narcissa Malfoy smiled unpleasantly. I see that being Dumbledore's favorite has given you a false sense of security, Harry Potter. But Dumbledore won't always be there to protect you. Harry looked mockingly all around the shop. Wow, look at that. He's not here now, so why not have a go? They might be able to find you a double cell in Azkaban for you and your loser of a husband. Oh! Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Sassy like, Harry. Sassy, uh, Harry. sassy Harry is the best. And now we're getting, we're not just getting Sassy Harry to a fellow student. We're getting Sassy Harry to an adult. Harry's 16 now. He's not fucking around. Oh, yeah, no. And it's amazing. <laughs> poor Madame Malkin, though. Yeah, poor Madame I know, Malkin. She's just, just like, put in the worst situation. Take it outside, please. please. I, can, <laughs> I will happily sell clothes to whoever survives this, but I don't want to, like. <laughs> You know, have to yeah. clean blood off of unsold <laughs> yeah. garments. Yeah, so she, yeah, she really doesn't want to be in this dispute at all. So she tries to just continue doing her job. So she goes to lift up and pin Malfoy's left sleeve and he freaks the hell out, which at first I didn't understand why, but then you learn later why, which we'll discuss. Mm -hmm. But he freaks out, says that they're going to leave and go to some other store. And Narcissa is like the ultimate, she's the mom version of the dad of the snooty rich girl in Willy Wonka where yeah, yeah, yeah. she just yeah. like goes along with whatever her kid says because he makes a fuss and then she's like, yeah, we're getting out of here and going to this other store. It's like, geez, she's got no backbone at all. They leave and Harry, Ron and Hermione like get the robe situation and they meet up with the Weasleys and then they head on down to the joke shop. Weasley's Wizarding Wheezes. And oh boy, is it grand. There is a huge poster outside saying, Why are you worrying about you know who? You should be worrying about you know poo. The constipation sensation that's gripping the nation. Like, oh my God. I just single tear rolled During down my Lord's face word. when I read yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's that's what they call <laughs> um, tone setting yeah. in the business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so absolutely amazing. So they go inside and the store is mobbed, absolutely mobbed. And they have amazing gifts. So they have the classics like the skiving snack boxes and the nosebleed nougats. But they've got new stuff like fake wands that turn into underpants when people try to use them. Smart quills that'll spell check for you. This like interactive hangman game for kids. These charms that make you daydream. Just amazing stuff all throughout the store. This is where I'm like, man, Harry, if he had just like set up a little bit more of a structure... He could have been like the Peter Thiel of the wizarding world. The investments that he could have had on the mm. store. Well, yeah. hey, we, the returns. It gets, it gets to that later. 
A little bit. Yeah, his return on investment is he gets whatever he wants for free. But he should have made a sharper deal, yeah. Yeah, he should have shark tanked it up and been like, you know, I'll give you this investment if you give me blah, blah, he blah. He should have asked for a percentage. Nope, didn't happen. Passed on that. So Hermione's like, wow, this is actually really impressive magic when she's looking at the daydream charm. And then Fred, which my favorite trope just in the history of movies or media or whatever is when people enter on dramatic lines because I always imagine them like hiding in a Wait window for until it. someone yeah. says Wait. Cool, for and then they it. open the door. So this happened twice in the same chapter in the fifth book, and I freaked out about it with Julia Shavini. And now this happened here. My love this trope. Right, because there's because it's that great like Voldemort line where Can't like, I know, Potter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can't, can't I, I Potter? <laughs> <laughs> it's he's so such good. a drama queen and I love it. Oh, I love it. I absolutely, I don't understand how people dislike Voldemort. He's so good. Oh, he's so great. good. <laughs> so uh, Hermione says it's impressive magic. And then Fred, with perfect timing, comes in and goes, for that, Hermione, you get one for free. They see her eye and they're like, oh my God, what happened? And she's like, oh, your telescope. And they're like, oh, right. Forgot about that thing. And they give her this cream <laughs> that is supposed to fix her black eye. And she's like, is this safe? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's totally safe. Which I was like, there's no way this cream is safe, but it turns out to be safe. Unless it happens like super delayed later. At least I've finished chapter nine and nothing bad has happened to her eye. Still in play that her eye explodes. You, <laughs> you never, never know. know if they're playing the long game. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, right. That was our heals you for 12 hours, but then gets worse later cream. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> they, <laughs> Fred and George say that they're actually making bank on stuff that they have in the back room. So they take the squad to the back room and it's all of this stuff that actually protects people from the Death Eaters and dark magic. Uh, they made a bunch of shield based clothing because in the previous book they did those hats that shield people from hexes yeah. and yeah. the ministry got wind of it and ordered 500 of them to give to their entire support staff so yeah. now they have all sorts of clothing with that built in which is pretty sweet like it's not going to protect you from one of the unforgivable curses but if someone just tries to throw a little jinx on you you'll be able to protect it with clothes Every little which bit is helps. sweet Right? It's super awesome. It all gets back to defense contracting, you guys. It yeah. really does. Mm -hmm. So they use vanishing powder as well. They have some like decoy detonators that make noise way far away, so it'll distract people. Just some really cool stuff. Harry is going to purchase one of these decoy detonators, and they go, oh, no, Harry, you can have anything you want for free. And he's like, what? And they're like, yo, you gave us the starting loan. We're going to let you have whatever you want. So... That's pretty sweet. He should probably take it up and just take a million of everything because he is losing out on lots of money. He should definitely be getting like as much like protection gear yeah. as he Yeah, could. he should stock up like every article of clothing he needs because yeah. he's yeah. target number one for Voldemort. Fred and George then move on to pressing Ginny about her dating life. They have learned from Ron that she's dating Dean Thomas and apparently thought a rumor that she was dating multiple people at once. We later learn it's just like lots of boys have crushes on Ginny. It's not that she's actually dating a bunch of boys at once. They ask what happened to Michael Corner, her previous boyfriend, and she says he was a bad loser. And I know that this is because he lost to Ginny at Quidditch and he didn't take it well and that's why she dumped him. But in, when I first read it, I thought she was just calling him a loser. And, like, not only loser, but, like, he's a bad, bad loser. loser. Like, he's a bad loser. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was way funnier. But, you know, I guess what she says makes sense. But I do like Ginny. You know, I like that she dumped a dude for just not being, you know, for having fragile masculinity, basically. In control of her life and not putting up with any of that man's she, bullshit. She's not going to take any crap. Right? So good. So good. Ron has a bunch of stuff that he wants to buy. And Fred George say, that will cost you three galleons, nine sickles, and a nut, which we have not heard of before. But I'm guessing that is the wizard penny. Uh, they eventually say that, okay, we'll drop the nut off, three galleons and nine sickles. And Ron is like, I don't have that kind of money. I'm your brother. Let me have it. And they're like, no, <laughs> which I think is fantastic. Ron is upset at this, so he flips them off, or at least it is heavily implied that he flips them off. The book says he makes a rude hand gesture, but we can assume he gave him the middle finger. Oh, yeah. Um, no, and he, he, he does, because Mrs. Weasley friend that she'll jinx his fingers, so he's giving, she, yeah, the British. Yeah, she's, yeah she says, if I see you it again, I will, yeah. I will tie your fingers together. Yeah. Right after this happens, Harry notices Malfoy running down the street by himself, which he thinks is suspect because he was with his mom the whole time. So he's like, if he is running by himself, he's got to be up to something that would make him want to ditch his mom. So he gets Ron and Hermione under the invisibility cloak, and they chase after him. 
find out that he's going to Nocturne Alley. Ooh. All of the stores in Nocturne Alley are empty. No one is there. Like, no one's in the stores, no one's shopping. It's just completely deserted, which makes sense. Who wants to be in the dark magic part of the shop area? <laughs> like, who wants to be in the dark magic section of the mall when Voldemort is running amok? So they use extendable ears to hear what's going on. But Malfoy is inside of Borgen and Burks, which is the same store that Harry accidentally flew powdered into that one time. And Malfoy's having a discussion with Borgen, and it's a very violent conversation. He's being very mean and heated. And when this first happened, it made me think, like, Malfoy had so much confidence in this argument. I was like, is Malfoy a, an official Death Eater or something now? And later on, that becomes what Harry takes away from this. Since they put the ears up there, like halfway through the conversation, they don't know what Malfoy is talking about. Right. But he vaguely talks about something that he has at home that he needs to be fixed, that he can't bring in, but Borgen knows how to fix it. And Malfoy says that if he doesn't, you know, to make sure that he fixes it, he's going to have a guy named Fenrir Greyback, who I'm guessing is just like a bouncer at a club, you know, come <laughs> in and make sure that he's giving it his full attention. Have we, have we gotten... The introduction I, to who Greyback is at this point? Has he been I mentioned ever? I don't remember if he's been mentioned yet. I don't think we've fully met him. The only way he might be mentioned is if he was one of the people that was at the ministry attack when they did the laundry list of all the people that were there. Oh, sure. He was um, not. I don't think he was Okay, there, then I... He's a very either I've person. completely forgot him, and I apologize to all the listeners, or we haven't, like, gotten a description of him yet. I think, okay, I think that I think it's, it's coming. coming. Yeah. Okay. Would be my yes. guess. We're coming by the end of this book. Oh, yes. cool, 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 cool. You are, of course, right. He is a bouncer at a club. Yes. Yeah, okay, that's, good, that's good, good, main, good. That's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Malfoy implies that Borgen has a copy or another one of whatever this thing he's talking about at his store. And Malfoy also mentions that he can't just be seen walking around with this because Borgen's like, why don't you bring yours into the store? And he's like, are you kidding me? I can't be seen in public with it. So we have no <laughs> idea what it is. I have no guess at all as to what this is and the squad doesn't either so before Malfoy leaves he says not a word to anyone not even my mother and I don't know if I misread this but it seemed like at some point it implied that Malfoy might have tried to show him the dark mark tattoo I don't know if that was there or if that was just something that like I thought happened but I feel like there was something there about it. I think that you're right. No, yes. I think that yeah. that does happen. Yeah, they like can't they can't see it, but it looks like it's um, you know, Borgen says, well, without seeing it, I must say it'll be a very difficult job, perhaps impossible. I couldn't guarantee anything. Next line, no, said Malfoy, and Harry knew just by his tone that Malfoy was sneering. Perhaps this will make you more confident. Yeah. He moved towards Borgen and was blocked from view by the cabinet, mm -hmm. and they kind of shuffle and try to see what's going on, but like. They don't catch it, but afterwards, Borgen is like, whoa! Very frightened. Yeah. Holy shit, yeah. this was yeah. scary. So yeah, my guess is that it was the dark mark, and then later, in a couple chapters, Harry has that same guess, which makes me less confident in my guess, because <laughs> Harry is usually wrong. Harry just kind of falls for all those red herrings. He does. And sometimes for, like, purple herrings that he's like, ah, yeah, no, that thing, totally. Except every now and then they're right, so you can't, like, it's not like Ron. Like, if Ron was like, I bet he's a Death Eater, you'd be like, okay, not correct. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Harry says you're like, ah, maybe. It's a 50-50 shot. I yeah. think that the good barometer is whether anyone outside of the squad takes it seriously. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. if anyone is like, you know, that seems reasonable, guaranteed to be wrong. <laughs> the moment that everyone is like across the board like nah you're crazy that's impossible then you know right <laughs> so before draco leaves he says not a word to anyone not even my mother which is intense uh, hermione then tries to walk in uh. and pretend that she's just shopping in general <laughs> to try to see like which one of the items because draco makes this big to do about like don't sell this to anyone so hermione tries to like ask about the price of a bunch of different things it doesn't work and then she tries to pull out all the stops and is like see that boy who was in there before draco he's a friend of mine and i'm trying to get him a birthday present but if he has something reserved in the store i don't want to buy uh. it for him and the guy's just like get out <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> just but, so good. So she gets back, and then Ron's like, wow, real nice going, Hermione. And she's like, I'd like to see you do it, Master of Mystery. And apparently they bicker all the way back to the store. I just, I love this moment <laughs> so much. This chapter just, like, really, like, is nailing a lot of, like, the things that Hermione's not, like, super graceful at. She's bad at Quidditch. She's getting mm-hmm. hit in the face and getting yeah. black eyes. She's uh-huh. sucking at, like, intrigue and sort of, you know, Right, she's espionage. unable to defuse this tense situation. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they go back to the, the joke shop. Mrs. Weasley asks where they were. They say that they were in the back room. You just didn't see us. And that is the end of chapter six. And it's also the end of this episode of Potterless. But this has been a great time. Sarah and Gabrielle, thanks for joining. How are you guys feeling about these two chapters in particular? I like these two chapters. You, you know... sort of feel the gears beginning to pick up and like the book sort of really beginning to get underway. And I think that for me, all the pre-Hogwarts chapters in the books are very hit or miss. Yeah, yeah. yes, And yes, I yes. think that book six is one of the, the more six. entertaining ones. Oh, oh for sure. Because uh, we get those first couple least. chapters that aren't told from Harry's perspective, which I thought was really cool. And then all of the stuff that happens here is actually intense. So, like, book five pre-Hogwarts, rough. Book six pre-Hogwarts, really solid. As funny as it is... To just sort of be like, how could this how could this possibly ever work? I do like throwing Fleur into the Weasley yeah. family mix. <laughs> yeah. And just kind of seeing yeah. like the chaos that reeks upon everyone. They're one of those like really good families. And I feel like my family is like this too, where it's like, if we like you, you're in and we love you and you're exactly like a family member. But if you do something that rubs us the wrong way, like our dinner conversation is going to be just making fun of you for 30 consecutive minutes. <laughs> and like, it's something I can relate to with my groups of friends and family. So it's funny to see the Weasleys just all have the same stance against Fleur and then they just rag on her. And yeah. it's also interesting because by the time that we meet the Weasleys, they're sort of this like grizzled family that's like, <laughs> we've seen it everything. We've had a million kids. Yeah. I'm all of them have fucked shit. up. All of them have had trouble. But this is like, no, they've never had to deal with this. This is their mm-hmm. first yes. kid that's getting engaged. This is the first time that sort of like, you know, a new person is kind of having to be integrated into the family. And mm-hmm. a person with who's just coming from literally a different place right, and sure. with completely different sort of values and priorities than they have. So it's yeah. fun to see, especially Molly, I think, be genuinely oh, yeah. discombobulated. This is the thing, yeah. I think, that's that makes these chapters one of the things that make them so interesting is just everyone's sort of on the back foot a little bit. The mysteries are already underway and everyone is sort of slightly out of their comfort zone and like there's things to do. Um, There's, yeah, a sense of of tension and of working things out uh, to especially these two chapters. And they're funny. They are funny. They are really funny. Funny chapters. Ginny Weasley, keep keep killing it. (laughs) She carries the comedy flag, and it's really good. Yeah, so awesome. Um, Thank you guys so much for joining along. Do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about your amazing, gripping podcast, Wolf 359? Oh, uh, sure. Um, In 500 words or less. Um, (laughs) So Wolf 359 is an audio drama. Uh, It just finished this past Mm -hmm. December. We wrapped up our fourth and final season. Basically, it's about four people who are all doing kind of a three-year rotation on board a space station that is in very deep space, kind of in a reconnaissance mission, doing some scientific scientific work, some survey for the possibilities of alien life. Yes. And it's kind of about them slowly discovering a couple of mysterious things that are happening on the mm-hmm. station, a couple of evil plots. Yeah. And, and also just, just a lot about dealing themselves. with them, with their own boredom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of kind of like, you know, when you're in the most isolated space imaginable, how do you stop yourself from going crazy? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's fun. It's really good. I love it. I plowed through it because when I started listening to it, it was almost done. So I marathon through it. I view it like Breaking Bad where like the beginning of it was like very funny and and silly mm-hmm. and lighthearted. And you're like, oh, and you grow close to these characters like comedically and jovially. And then, and then season two hits and you're like, oh, no, everything is serious now. And then you're like so captivated. So I really, I recommend it to everyone listening. It's a good old time. And yeah, you guys wrote some amazing, amazing stuff for it. So well, thank, thank you so you much. You did great so work. Kind of you. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you guys for being on. We'll see you on the next episode. And listeners, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, before the train leaves from King's Cross Station, wizard on. Awesome. 
If you enjoy listening to Potterless, but you don't want the party to stop here, why don't you join one of our amazing social media communities? You can find us at twitter.com slash potterlesspod, facebook.com slash potterless, where we also have our private closed group, and instagram.com slash potterlesspodcast. It's a great way to interact with me, as well as fellow listeners of the show, and it's always a good time. Lots of meme sharing, lots of laughing. Potterless is created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Michael Vandersley, Sadie Bear, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Klaus Lopum, Alex Stark, Rebecca Adamek, Frank Chiotto, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfelio, Sheila Vidyanathan, Jenna Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Luis Nusak, Akanksha Saxena, Sarah Salvador, Rebecca Winces, Abid Ahmed, Caitlin Jordan Pontolo, Lee Xiaoru, Ayana Chalewa, Benjamin Bridges, Dave the Mailman, Rosemarie Dodge, Jill Boulay, Maria Lisa C. Keen, Maria Poldson, Jennifer Inglis, Ariel, Christina Emerson, Romina Rivadanira, Serenity, and Kumail Doc. Web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamana. For any and all information on the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com and you can subscribe to us on any of your preferred podcasting apps, including Spotify. Thanks again so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on! <laughs>